Hello, folks. Good evening. Hi. Hi, Alice. How are you? I'm going to mute you. <laughs> In any case, my name is Alice Hutchinson. I'm the owner of Bird's Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut, and I'm honored to be the host of Write America. The aim of this series is to help set the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Write America is a literary series created by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors and new and emerging writers in readings and conversations each week about how books and art might bridge the deep divisions in our nation. Write America celebrates the quiet power of art in our lives, the unifying power of the highest uses of language. In novels, stories, essays, and poems, we recognize one another as parts of the human family, one family. Roger Rosenblatt, the creator of Write America, puts it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So with that, I welcome you as several of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us together. We will wind up this spectacular two-year run at the end of this month with the last episode next Tuesday. If you missed our previous episodes with Priya Jane and Ann Peretz, you can go to Bird's Books Write America page and link to the episode easily. All of our recordings are now on Write America YouTube channel for you to watch at any time. Tonight's episode is also being recorded, so if you miss something, you can go back and rewatch. The link is right on the front page of our website. Tonight, we are hosting readings by and conversation with Carl Phillips, Gail Mazur, and Adam Gopnik. I will return at the end after the readings and discussion and bring your questions and comments to the authors. During the episode, please feel free to make comments or ask questions in the chat. We do ask that you remain muted, however. Our first speaker is Carl Phillips. Carl Phillips is the author of 16 books of poetry, most recently, Then the War and Selected Poems, 2007 to 2020, which will publish in paperback next month and was just long listed for the Penn Award in Poetry this week. His most recent prose book is The Art of Daring, Risk, Restlessness, Imagination. His most recent publication is... My Trade is Mystery, Seven Meditations from Life in Writing, which is an essay book about the writing life released in November of 2022. Honors include the Aiken Taylor Award for Modern American Poetry, the Kingsley Tufts Award, a Lambda a Literary Award, and the Penn USA Award for Poetry, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Library of Congress, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the Academy of, Amer and the Academy of American Poets. Phillips lives in St. Louis, where he teaches at Washington Universities. Please welcome to the screen, Carl Phillips. Let me grab you here, Carl. All right. There you go. Here I am. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alice uh, and Birds Books and Roger for this whole series and for inviting me. And it's really a pleasure and an honor to be reading with uh, Gail and Adam and I'm going to read uh, poems uh, from my book, Then the War, that Alice mentioned. And I guess I'll just dive on in, <laughs> set my little timer here. Uh, all right. This is called And Swept All Visible Signs Away. Easy enough to say it's dark now. But what is the willow doing in the darkness? I say it wants less for company than for compassion, which can come from afar and faceless. What's a face to a willow? If a willow had a face, it would be a song, I think. I am stirred, I'm stirrable, I'm a wind-stirred thing, the song would go. But there is no song, as there is no face. There's just the willow as willow, nothing but itself. Its shadow meaningless, except to those who want for shade and find it there. Who keep finding they hardly care anymore, almost some days as if they'd never cared about connection. Green as water, the willow's motion. Green as oblivion, 
the willow's indifference, flecked with a little gold, some blue. Right, that's a poem. Um, I'm calling it a poem. And this next poem is called Dangerous Only When Disturbed. Of bird songs, I know only three for certain, cardinal, blue jay, raven, though perhaps the last two don't count, not as song, more call than song, more cry, by which I mean exclamatory, not the kind with tears. Not that tears can't be song sometimes, depending on who's weeping, for what reason, and with what degree of restraint, finally, at least half of what any music worth being called music's made of. As for the rest, release? Does that still sound right? Did you know the blue of the blue morpho butterfly's iridescent wings isn't biological, but an engineering of light, that they're not blue at all? In the song of you, in the song I make of you, in which your horselessness means a fear of horses, nothing more than that, you are a man asleep beneath the willow's umbrella. You've grown your hair out. The hair rises the way dream does to the cool descent of the willow's branches. From the thicket that hair and branches and dream make, I haven't forgotten you. It's just I've been distracted between the sound of birds singing somewhere and this inability to keep any song left inside me from ruining everything, or so I tell myself. And like that, if not true as in provable, as in here's proof, it's true enough to believe in. You're awake, I think. Your mouth is moving. All right. <clears throat> um, this is a shorter poem. It's called Little Shields. I actually don't remember what it's called. It's called, oh, Little Shields in Starlight, <clears throat> which I guess is my fancy poetic way of saying leaves, but that would be a less interesting title. Little Shields in Starlight. Maybe there's no need for us to go anywhere more far than here, said the dogwood leaves, mistaking speech for song to the catalpa leaves, imitating silence. It was like sex when pushed the tenderness to either side of it, it's just sex, hardly sex at all. Hardly worth mentioning, except forgetting seems so much a shame lately, and why shouldn't there be records, however small, of our having felt something without for once having to name it? I know what my dirt is, as if that were enough, might well even have to be, to have moved mostly with the best intentions, at least, before we stopped. That's all that happens, I think. We stop moving forever. Got a little script here. That's what I'm staring at, in case you're wondering. Uh, all right. Tells me how to find things. This poem is called Soft Western Light. There are places where it's still possible to watch bees map a garden out with what used to be called industry in a language that feels each day less and less my own. But the dream of exile turns out mostly to have been a false one. Me cutting the weaker parts routinely away from what set a bit more free that way might more likely flourish. It seems it's better to flourish. To confine desire to what holds sweetness. How small desire would be. In the more reliable dream, but who's to say more true? I'm just a body like any other in the world in motion. The leaves shift slightly as I pass beneath them. Not acknowledgement, but like that. It's as if they cared for me or felt at least they should seem to care. I'll miss you too. All right. I believe we have three more poems here. Uh, this one's called To Autumn. Uh, and 
I'll say it. Well, it is in two parts, but don't let that alarm you. <clears throat> it's it's still short. I get bothered when people say things are in multiple parts and then you don't know, know how many and how long they are. All right, to Autumn. Whatever it is that some nights can rescue cricket song from becoming just more of the usual white noise, tonight it's working. The hours toss with the apparent weightlessness of leaves when each leaf seems, for once, its own dream, not part of the larger, more general dream of leaves being limited to tossing with either diminishment or renewal when, why should those be the only choices? What about joy and despair? What about ambition? If wild, I was once more gentle. There's a version of autumn where the star's reflections on the river tonight look at one moment like freight thrown overboard, at the next like signal lights cast up through water by a city submerged where the river's deepest. There's another version. Holiness has no limits there, only two requirements, to be hidden, to adore what's hidden. Um, this poem is called, So the Mind Like a Gate Swings Open. When it comes to what eventually it must come to, don't forget to say to yourself, has it come to this again already? Look a little lost maybe, but unsurprised. Sometimes it feels like being a carousel horse, but with all the paint gone strange-like, all the wood gone driftwood, all the horses I've corralled inside me set free, confused now, because now what? The snow fell like hope when it's been forsaken, just before the wind shifts, then the wind shifts, the snow flies upward. I love you means what exactly? In the end, desire may turn out to be no different from any other song, sing and be at last released from it. Not so long ago as I'd like to think, I used to get drunk in parking lots with strangers. We park, we drink and and didn't think what to call it, the rest that came after. What is a thing like that worth calling? He took me into his arms. He held me. I know longings a lot like despair. Both can equal everything you've ever hoped for, if that's how you want it. Sure, I get that. What's wrong with me, I used to ask, but usually too late and not meaning it anyway. He touches me or I touch him or don't. Um, and I'll end with this poem called um, My Monster. And I'm saying I'm ending with this poem, not only because I'm ending, but because Alice said to give a hint that we were moving towards the conclusion. So I wouldn't be like floating around in wherever I am here. Okay, so this is called My Monster. Uh, uh, oh, you know what? I'm going to a really short poem because I said I was a stickler for time and I'm already over the time that I was going to do. So I'm gonna read this poem called Silver Chest. And that's gonna be the end, Silver Chest. Unafraid is what we were, I think and then afraid, though it mostly seemed otherwise. I opened my eyes, I saw, I closed, I shut them. The usual morning glories twist up through banks of gone wild by now holly, crickets for song, morphos for their glamour, which is quiet, blue and quiet. You, the dark that nothing, not even the light displaces. You who have been the single leaf that won't stop tossing among the others. For you. Thank you.
Thank you. Goodbye. I'm going to mute myself. Thank you, Carl. Our next speaker is Gail Mazur. Gail Mazur is the founding director of the Blacksmith House Poetry Series and the author of six previous books of poems, including They Can't Take That Away From Me, a finalist for the National Book Award. She has won fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the, and the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College, as well as the St. Botolf Club Foundation Distinguished Arts Award. Sorry about that, Gail. Please welcome to the screen, Gail Mazur. Let me ask you to unmute. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Ellis, and thank you, Carl. Um, it was wonderful to hear you read after quite a while. You must come back to Boston. Um, I'm going to read a couple of poems from my latest book and a couple of new ones. I'm really, really proud and delighted to be, to be reading in this series and to be the penultimate group, to be in the penultimate group. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is called Hall Mirror. And that's what it's about, a hall mirror, sort of. Oh, wave your hands wildly if you can't hear me. Great. Federal style, two small chips in the gilt frame, found at a flea market in the Eisenhower 50s. 19th century American, lovingly refinished, loving gift of my mother. Quote, it's too good for you, so take care of it. Unquote. Some mornings here, the taut lit face of Ethel Rosenberg or the ecstatic face of Blake, punim of my six-year-old grandmother arriving stunned and mute from Vilna, her big sister Lena waiting, who knew what was at stake. Oh, my fierce mother, sanding away at the kitchen table, protected by newspapers, the Herald, the Forward, the Traveler, her little brush, her jar of paste preserving and inventing the past. For what? For me. For today, half conscious glimpse of myself on my way out for a walk in February snow with a friend or alone. My blue woolen hat, my mirror smile. This is called at 4 a.m. Some people have an appetite for grief, Emerson wrote. And years ago reading that, I thought, not me. Though I knew what he meant, I'd known people to default to it. People married to woe, dumbfounded by any sort of merriment. Still, I thought our venerable sage judged some people harshly from his conquered manse, where character meant transcending the insane pull he'd known when widowed young, he'd nearly died of grief, of rending rage. Non-negotiable loss. We know some people seem to thrive on it. They can't be coaxed into the light. Lightheartedness won't touch them or delight. It's hum negligible and irritant, a cloud of gnats to brush away. Did lofty Emerson disdain them for frailty of spirit? No, but he was done with it. That first loss temp tempering him oddly into calm for the losses that would come. The calm that said, grief can teach me nothing. Not me, not now. I know day when it makes me can bring back endless night. Even here long uncompanioned, or companioned by grief and joy, the he in me. I hunger for laughter, for touch, for tears my hand can brush away. My work now to continue learning to absorb the loss and live. Is that work enough? How can I know who or what can help me learn? I'm a peasant, 
the humbled Mike Tyson said, at one point I thought life was about acquiring things. Life is totally about losing everything. For a fighter, a violent man, that's knowledge hard earned, whose things were bulwark against self-loathing and despair. It's clear he knows now things can't be enough. But I don't care what Tyson knows or don't know why I care. Does his abrasive cleansing knowledge touch me? Yes. Or is it its devastating articulation? Living on here, I have what I have, an acceptance of loss that disappears in dreams, in excruciating replays of a life draining away. These visitations like falling trees unsummoned come. My night, a crushing yesterday, the lit bed light won't erase or wish away. Um, Carl and I share memories of a great American poet who was a great irascible, Alan Dugan. And I'm going to read um, a poem that I just wrote, wrote about him this year or whatever this year wasn't last year. He was, as I said, irascible and sort of impossible. And you either loved him for it and with it, or you didn't get it. It's called Untitled for Alan Dugan. I thought of him as having titled all his poems untitled, but in fact, it was just a few called Untitled. So that's sort of an homage. I've got writer's block. Your self-loathing mutter after chemo, writer's block, the bourgeois indulgence of the pampered. Had you finally confronted Coleridge's indefinite, indescribable terror? Months later, when I ask if you're working, yeah, I'm making notes. Notes, lifeblood our good days pulse with, work the only of onlys. A lifetime of punishing your body, how you must have loathed it until the body refused to collude anymore. You were physical wreck yet wreckage, yet even so your cauterizing intelligence not quite disabled. And you'd never admit despair, only disgust at your own womanish complaint, writer's block. Some of your poems you titled Untitled Poem, Fuck the indexers, the Ivy ac ac academics. Your lack of pretension, or was it arrogance, an offering to the god of poetry, or a thumb in his eye. Old iguana, cold-blooded, spiny one, could you have relished the world's disorder but abhorred the world? When a doctor warned drinking would kill you, you'd shoot up at my house with a six pack of caliber, still a tough guy. I knew you were glad to see me, even with no gun in your pocket. Now I recite your lines to myself, still tickled by my imitation of your gruffness. I love to grunt Dugan style. No, style isn't the word. Oh, I got up and went to work and worked and came back home and ate and talked and went to sleep. With its undugan like Volta, love must be the reason for the world. For, I'm sorry, love must be the reason for the week. Caustic, graceless, you were a hard man, the least playful, except sometimes in your poems. Still poetry was no game, was it? Art making's a job. The worker shows up for it. Your early day job at the diaphragm factory fit your adamant refusal of the romantic. Above your desk, shelves of drafts, unfinished and finished poems, each in its own faded brown envelope. Have they been forgotten, lost, shredded? Poems so singular, so unaccommodating, some writers I know would have killed to steal them.
Um, this poem is called The, the Flea. And um, it's an, it refers to the Wellfleet flea market. It's what the year, the year rounders call it, the flea. The flea, that's what the year rounders call it, rummaging through tools or brick of rock, then gossiping all day at their tables in the blistering sun, their faded beach umbrellas hardly shading the tarmac. This is what my mother did in New Hampshire, Sunday after widowed Sunday into her 80s. Up at dawn, her wagon packed the night before, by noon, willing to mark down anything to not have to rewrap and pack the whole kit and caboodle for the sticky hundred or so mile drive home. Today, I pick up a teapot, white with a smattering of pink and black and aqua stars, I like its flawed galleys I reject from the start, its jaunty asterisks, its modern form, manufactured in Syracuse in the 50s, pleases me. Also seven starry cups and five chipped star-studded dinner plates, ordinary optimistic dishes, probably used by one particular Cape Cod family for decades, only dings and cracks now to tell their homely provenance, their good usage, to keep the price down. Not starstruck, my mother would have picked them up, felt the edges roughness with her thumb and found them wanting. It wouldn't have been the chips. She treasured her broken miniatures, her minis. These just weren't her thing. But like a ninny, I can make something of this, can't I? I buy the lot in her magpie memory, wrapped in old globes for what a small cappuccino would cost these days, or a Parisian mystery. Um, my last poem is, is one I think I'm still working on, or maybe I will be forever. And again, thank you, Alice. Thank you, Roger. And thank you, Adam and Carl, for sharing this wonderful event with me. Poems. I've made them. And like children, they'll stop being mine. But what are they made of? Not flesh, not sinew, not blood. Yet they stayed with me, sometimes docile, yet sometimes argumentative even weeks after I'd send them away. Just look, I can put my right hand on one, not bone, nor fur, nor blood, not clear glass, though they do beg to be polished. They want to shine, always near me, of me, but for how long? When will they steal off to separate lives to live on their own, hungry or sated? Who do they think they are? Without me, where could they think they're going? Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Our next speaker is Adam Gopnik. Adam Gopnik has been writing for the New Yorker since 1986. He is a three-time winner of the National Magazine Award for Essays and for Criticism of the George Polk Award for Magazine Reporting. In March 2013, Gopnik was awarded the Medal of Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by French Republic. His newest book, The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery, hits bookstores this March. He lives in New York City with his wife and their two children. Please welcome to the screen, Adam Gopnik. Let me find you, Adam. Where are you? There you go. Unmute. I will unmute. Can you hear me now? Great. Well, it's a pleasure, um, Alice, to to be here tonight. This is my uh, my second visit uh, to Write America. My first was with the wonderful Alan Bergman, who I hope uh, the great American lyricist, who I hope is with us tonight. And it's a particular honor and and in the deep sense of privilege to be reading with a couple of important American poets, us pedestrian prose writers, dream in our sleep of someday uh, achieving the level of poetry. And my only hope is, is that there's some commonality of metaphor in what 
uh, us prose writers and reporters do that occasionally lets us touch the fringe of the garment of poetry. I thought I would read tonight a piece from that new book called The Real Work on the Mystery of Mastery. Um, it's um, This is a piece, the book is composed uh, of a series of essays about learning to do things in middle age, learning to draw, learning to drive, learning to box. And there's a whole section actually about uh, Mike Tyson um, in, in the book. And uh, those uh, chapters are, are uh, interspersed with uh, sort of meditations on particular mysteries of mastery, the mystery of intention, uh, the mystery of meaning in music, and in this case, the mystery of interiority. And I uh, was listening to Carl with enormous pleasure and with a, a powerful sense, too, that his uh, beautiful poetry, a, a beautiful poem about uh, the bird as a metaphor and as a reflection on a certain kind of human mortality was very close to what I wanted to read. Um, I also, I should add quickly, I am a habitué of the Wellfleet flea market uh, where we go in the month of August. And one of my proudest possessions is a, uh, uh, a cast iron pan uh, found there at the Wellfleet flea market. So I couldn't have uh, appreciated more that, uh, that wonderfully expansive poem. Uh, so this is called The Third Ma Mystery of Mastery. And I should add that this will be truly the first time I have ever read from this book or any piece of it so I have not time tested it adequately, but if I seem to be going past uh, 10 minutes, I will supply my own vaudeville hook and pull myself uh, off stage. This is called The Third Mystery of Mastery, The Hummingbird's Heartbeat, or The Mystery of Interiority. By now you have heard the rumor. <clears throat> the hummingbird and the whale have the same number of heartbeats in a lifetime, differently expended. In that truth, we seek some consolation for the speed of our mortality. Each being has a heart that beats a billion times, one over months, the other over decades. The hummingbird lives a brief and busy life, its heart beating literally a thousand times a minute, and the whale a slow and ponderous existence out in the deep. Yet their inner experience, the heartbeat rhythm of their lives is, we're told, foundationally alike. The hummingbird would not trade its place for the whales because the hummingbird's life is the whales in a decent existential translation. Just as Mozart was writing his late work, purified, simplified, the essence of his melodic genius when he was still in his 30s, the hummingbird enjoys the fruits of youth at one week, the wisdom of old age at 32 months. The deeper question this rumor raises is about the limits our carnality puts on our capacities. What can't we do because we aren't designed to do it? As much as anything else, it is the physical limitations of being human that shapes our approach to the real work. The real work is the encompassing term I use for the strange phenomenon of human mastery. This is true in ways both small, break a finger and you will not be able to fret your guitar, and large. For the first part of our lives, we grow, then we begin to age, and while growth carries with it the potential of learning, age is inevitably bound up with things discarded. We stoop, we bend, we break, we gasp for breath, and our shiny visions of doing anew and making over run up routinely against the brick and cement wall of fact. But there's a lot we simply can't do. And not just the obvious physical stuff that leaves the happy jogger dead of a heart attack at 50 and the older woman with the facelift looking only like an older woman with a facelift. The limit affects our inner accomplishments too as names become harder to find and the inequities of life become more piercing in their entry into our lives. In the face of that uncompromising physicality, we search for some kind of heart's ease, a hope and one way we find it is to insist that there are secret solvents of the injustice of our interiors, of our plumbing and construction, and the cell by date imprinted on our genome. One hope lies in the odd connection between, literally, as the kids say, the insides of our heads and the beatings of our hearts. The limits on our accomplishments may be constrained by our plumbing and our heating. There may be only so many heartbeats to go around. But if our consciousness of our heartbeats is shaped by our own internal clocks, why, we might partake of one common oceanic swell of life. 
With every creature sentenced alike to a billion heartbeats, we can choose how to expend them quickly in a fever of work like Mozart or Towns Van Zandt or slowly like Methuselah and Willie Nelson. Mozart lost his heartbeats quickly in the cause of music. Methuselah spent his heartbeats slowly for some strange patriarchal purpose. The tragedy of mortality might be, if not evaded, then at least eased as inner experience. Though our public incapacity and decline may be inescapable, our private experience of pleasure and existence may be in itself a leveling force. Our interior experience of accomplishment and mastery matter. They may even matter most of all. We lost the public race to the best long ago. The inequities of circumstance and of the complicated thing called talent may have put us permanently in the rear. But the last runner need compete only with herself. Her heartbeats are well expended even in the loss. I take as much pleasure from playing Lullaby of Birdland badly as George Shearing did in writing it well. Use your heartbeats, cries the internet meme. And as the poet Mary Oliver wrote, we can at least choose how to spend them, decide what it is you plan to do with your own wild and precious life. This is the kind of thing that seems unknowable, but in fact can be known. It turns out that there is a whole research project devoted to the study of the variety of animal heartbeats from hummingbird to human at North Carolina State University, where under the direction of a visionary of citizen science named Rob Dunn, a handful of ingenuous researchers decided to find out how many heartbeats each creature actually has. They realized that they could turn to the citizens, the public, and ask them to send in whatever heartbeats beats they had counted. By now, they have counted heartbeats from 176 species of mammals, 60 species of birds, 40 species of reptiles, and 41 species of fish. And what have they found? Well, Lauren Nichols, one of the scientists on the project, sums it up uh, and who's has the winning habit of referring to obscure animals whose heartbeat she has studied, but whose scientific names she can't for the moment recall as whatchamacallits, as in it's one of those weird Australian whatchamacallits, sums up what they set out to find and what they found after they set out. She says, everyone was saying there's a close correlation between heart rate and length of life from monkeys to cats and dogs. But what kind of monkey? What kind of dog? By now we have a bunch of mammals, like 5,000 known mammals, known mammals, and we have more than 150 so far. But as the real numbers have come in on average, it really does seem to be true that all life averages out around a billion beats. Some species break the mold in either direction. You see the southern brown bandicoot, that's an Australian fauna mar mar marsupial, it gets less than 300 million, and so it has a pretty short lifespan. Closer to humans are red-faced spider monkeys, 270 beats per minute, and they live around 46 years, while a brush-tailed fascogal, that's another Australian much more call it, has 210 heartbeats per minute and can live for around six years. One thing for certain, we as humans, she goes on, are the top of the chain. If we get really old, we have the potential to get to 5 billion beats. Your heart is a muscle and can't regenerate, and there's a certain number of times it can beat before it wears itself out. It's like an experimental version, she says suddenly, of, you know, that Mary Oliver poem. You know, the one that ends, what is it you plan to do with your own wild and precious life? To hope for this leveling truth between birds and whales is, of course, to impart to the bird and the big fish an inner life that is peculiarly human. If we were hummingbirds, would our lives feel as long to us and full as those of whales? After all, we have managed to articulate our lives in so many neatly rounded segments that they give the decent, decent illusion of length, infancy, childhood, adolescence, maturity, middle age. Yet if nature constrains us, it helps us to know that those what those natural constraints really are. Nature gives us mixed consolations. Do the hummingbirds' hearts beat as they're said to? Or is it a pretty story hiding a darker physical truth? For example, that hummingbirds beat hard and briefly, then quit, while big charismatic creatures like whales get the heartbeats, the longevity, and eventually the mates, 
while the birds flutter over nectar briefly and then expire. So what the solution to the mystery of heartbeats is messy clear as truth tends to be. There is yes, a permanent thrumming heartbeat in the world, not quite audible or not heard without help that counts out again and again to a billion. If we could press our ears to the air and hear a billion heartbeats overlapping, one new set ready to begin as another ends, the percussion of existence, the sound of life would be audible, lulling in its regularity. Yet against that permanent rhythm come the little syncopations of our existence and those offbeats and extended beats are our possibility and our permanence. I suddenly thought of the drum solos that we all used to dread at rock concerts where the drummer would bash on for five excruciating extra minutes. <clears throat> Ringo Starr, greatest of drummers, whose regular Beatle beat has often been likened to a heartbeat, refused until the very end of the Beatles to play a solo. Until in the end, in the end, the last song on their last recorded album, he stopped refusing and declared himself briefly but loudly before sinking back into the band. Human life, it seems, is the drum solo in the rock concert of animal existence. It's too loud, much too long by the standards of all the other acts, and usually self-indulgent. No one really enjoys it, even if it always gets a standing ovation when it's over. Yet would we really cheat the drummer of his solo, even as we sigh and wait for the guitars and the singer to begin again? We're happy for the affirmation. We're not glad to have heard it, but we're not sorry it happened. Plans may all fail, but doings don't. We get a standing ovation for having persisted, or perhaps for being done. And I am done. Now you guys get to talk to each other. Oh. <laughs> We're amongst each other, I should say. Gail, you need to unmute. I am unmuted. I think I did unmute, didn't you, I? There you, you go. Yes, we're all unmuted. Thank you for both of you for those wonderful readings. Oh, Just terrific. It yes, was wonderful, to, wonderful to hear you. And we're all so different. Just yes. like snowflakes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's so funny right. you mentioned that, Gail, because there's a little section which I blipped over for fear of, of, of running too long about snowflakes in that chapter because I had done a piece once about the, you know, it's a, a similar kind of piece, science and sensibility piece, where it turns out, I'm sure you've heard this, that just as hummingbirds and whales do have the same number of heartbeats, roughly speaking, um, snowflakes, it turns out, are all alike. When they begin in the clouds as snow crystals, as, as crystals, they are alike and they change as they huh. fall to earth. And I did that as a comment for the New Yorker once and they, someone turned it into a little book called All Alike. So it's a much better metaphor for existence, actually, we become ourselves and individuals as we fall through our experience rather than being and catched we're, out. We're just falling through our experience. It's not even our fault. How we change, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> nor, nor more, no more than it is of the snowflakes. There's a fascinating character named Snowflake Bentley who lived in Vermont and just did photographs of snowflakes in the early part of the 20th century. And those are the famous ones that show you all those beautiful lace patterns. But what they don't show you is all of the ugly snowflakes, all of the asymmetrical <laughs> and, and failed ones. But I can't help but ask you, Gail, um, what's your, because uh, when you read about um, the flea, which of course I know well, um, what's your Wellfleet connection? My Wellfleet connection? Yes. Um, well, I live in Provincetown half the year. Huh. Yeah. Yes. Um, so for, for years, I, I didn't miss a flea, but um, I'm sated now. <laughs> I love the wealthy flea market. And in fact, over in the corner, you can't see it here, but well, sort of where that church window is, but there's a kneeler. I, I bought that kneeler um, at the flea market in Wellfleet. They told me that it had been taken from a convent in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And I drove it all the way out to Missouri uh, just as an object. I like these objects. Um, I don't kneel at it and do anything. But um, but anyway, so I like this connection that we have. And I still, still I've yet to go to the Wellfleet 
drive-in movie theater, but I keep meaning to before they stop doing movies like that. It, it's a wonderful place. It was a cathedral of our of our my children's existence because uh -huh. we would go up every summer, and the the the, the drive-in was the one drive-in. I you know like all of us, I grew up at or all of us at a certain sure. age. I grew up in drive-ins and we could go and and uh, and show the kids. And we insisted because they have an option of getting the sound through your car radio, through mm -hmm. Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or something. But we insisted on getting the little speaker, right? Of course. Inside. Of course, <laughs> right? And putting it, it was, it's, it genuinely was a, a poetic thing. I wanted them to hear the tinny amplification sure. of the drive-ins of my childhood. And they, and they did. Um, it's so you must go. Yeah, you you really have to go, Carl. I will. I you know we also have this Cape connection. I grew up in Falmouth at the other end of the oh, Cape, wow. and so and Gail, didn't you grow up in Mashpee? Mashpee, yeah, yeah. So not far away. So, but yeah, how I ended up in Missouri, I have no idea. But Adam, you you've proven to me that my mother was lying when she said people go let their children go to the movies. Don't care about them. <laughs> well, we didn't let them go to the movies. We drove, we forced them to go with us to the movies. I, they, by this point, they um they probably want to go go themselves. But you know, it was um uh it, you know it was through the pandemic. Of course, it was complicated because uh, well, everywhere was complicated, obviously. But we the the drive-in seemed like a safe place to go, right? Because you were in yeah. by nature. Sure. Uh, you know, isolated, but it's, um, uh, you know, it's funny, we're, we're celebrating this penultimate uh, uh, display. And of course, the pandemic is something that warped and altered lives. But I do think that it in if it had a you mentioned Carl New Bedford, right? And I couldn't help but think about how many people I know who read Moby Dick for the first time mm -hmm. over the last two years, right? That yeah. That, so many people embarked on great reading projects in response to the isolation. And if there were backward blessings to the pandemic that we that occasioned this series and that we've all lived through, it was in part that that while moviegoers to come up with that seemed to disengage from the movie theaters and so on, readers became more engaged in reading mm -hmm. uh, than perhaps they've ever been. Yeah. Were you part of that group that E. Young Lee did with uh, reading War and Peace? No, we read War and Peace. It's oddly that you mention it. We, my uh -huh. wife and I read War and Peace uh -huh. over the over the last couple of years, and she was in a group that read uh, that read Moby Dick. Uh, uh -huh. But I no, uh, I was nothing as grand as that. No, it was great, and we just read like ten pages a day, and I never thought I'd read War and Peace ever, and. Uh, so yeah, you're right. That was a nice sort of accidental result of the lockdown. What was the thing that surprised you most in War and Peace, Carl? Actually, well, first of all, the fact that I loved every moment of it. I thought there'd be slogs with the war part. But I yeah. think I was most surprised by the small scenes. There's some little scene where a little dog is just running along the lane while an army goes down. Very intimate, very small, intimate details that made, I guess I thought the book was going to be about all this grand stuff. And and it really, it truly does. I know people say this about many novels, but I felt like, oh, this is what life is, actually, that everything seemed to be incorporated in it. Um, the smallest things that like one time there was a little dog or a little bird that someone heard, and now the bird's dead and the people who heard it are dead. But this all seems somehow oddly comforting. Boy, I couldn't agree with you more, right? I had, you know, Tolstoyan expectations, right? That it would be a huge book about grand passions and great battles and so mm -hmm. on. And it's such a beautiful book because it has the the minute focus of Trollope or someone. It's all about yes. uh, dinner parties in St. Petersburg and little social rivalries mm -hmm. and the old man dying and who's going to collect his thing. I it's, I couldn't agree more. I was stunned because it's so beautifully realized at a micro level, which is not what the the afflatus, the the atmosphere around it suggests. I couldn't. Yeah. Um, my husband read it in the last month of his life. Oh. I hadn't read it. And and I made a resolution to read it, but it's still too loaded for me. You know, I can't. Um, 
of mm -hmm. course. I mean, he reported on it to me two or three times a day sometimes. You mm -hmm. know, I loved it so much. And and I can't really report it to him, so I just keep putting it off. It's but I'm reading Elias Kennedy, or at least I've read three pages of Elias Kennedy. So I feel <laughs> like I'm, I'm of, not. Of Otto de Fay or of which book? Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my brother brought me a brought me a copy so he's, he's trying to educate me into being more eurocentric <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sort of provincetown centric <laughs> well, provincetown has my favorite bookstore in yours aside alice but my favorite uh, kim's yes exactly yeah exactly yeah. i spend hours in there every summer the kids drop me off and then they go down the street for uh for dinner and puzzles and everything else and then they come and pull me out two hours later with oh, with 20 right. books you should tell me when you're coming i'll I, I i shall i shall indeed i shall indeed that's that's the best used bookstore it's practically the only used bookstore i know right now it's true isn't it yeah no it's true yeah. we have the little one heritage in wealthy but tim's oh, is right a, you know is I forgot about that one but Tim's is full of surprises. Mm -hmm. Every every summer. And also, um, every few years, I we go over books I'm willing to give him and the ones he's willing to take, and it's it does never seems to make a dent in my story. <laughs> but um, it's true. It's the curse of of writers and readers, right? Is that the books never seem actually to diminish, no matter how hard you try to diminish them. Mm -hmm. I shudder oh, to, and we don't take them out of the library. No, exactly. I shudder. I sort of my move my camera to show my <laughs> dilemma. Right, <laughs> every one of those books is needs a new home at some point because I've I've read yeah. them. But, uh, you know, we have to pass them on. I know there's piles. Not that I have so many shelves here, and and things are in piles on the floor. Alice just came back. Well, Adam, you redeem yourself because I don't sell used books. You can go to any <laughs> used bookstore you want in the country. Good. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm going to choke for a minute. You guys talk. Oh, oh okay. There <laughs> is a there's a question in the chat. Yeah. Yes, exactly. People, it says, "Did any of you read or reread something surprising over the pandemic?" Well, we we both said, uh, you know, Carl. And I both said we read War and Peace, and Gail told that very moving story about why she didn't read uh, War and Peace over the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to think. I'm looking around here. I had the occasion, one of my um, pandemic projects was to do a new anthology of S.J. Perlman, to my mind, the greatest American humorist for mm -hmm. Library of America. So it was a joyful thing at a moment when New York was shut down to read this most, um, the grumpiest and most uh, ornery of New York writers about the city and to go through 50 years of his work and mm -hmm. and put it pull it together. So that was my great uh pandemic uh reading project other than, well, other than be, Tolstoy. Will there be an anthology? Yes, it came out, it just came out last fall. It's uh SJ Perlman in Library of America and one of those oh, great. Uh, one yeah. of those type ones. Well I'd ask each of you, did you find it easier or harder to write during the pandemic? Because I've heard it 50-50. I found it harder. I found it, I found it, I found it easier, but I actually wrote. Oh, sorry, Gail, are you still talking? I was just going to say yeah. it was odd because my most recent book, which is now almost three years old, came out right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's usually, you know, usually you're, you, you're freed up and you write more. You know, because you had the last few months, you didn't get much done. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, it's a. I think it's all uh, that the book you mentioned, Alice. The uh, my trade is mystery. I wrote during pandemic, um, during lockdown, and it actually was conducive to. I don't think I was writing poems as much, but I knew I was going to write seven chapters for this mm -hmm. end night. And I actually hit out in Brewster on the Cape um, and would do two chapters a month. And 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 so in that it was almost as if the lockdown made it easier to do a scheduled kind of writing. 
as opposed to how poems to me just sort of appear or not, and those weren't really appearing. But it seemed as if, um, I know this is different from the kind of work you were talking about, Adam, but I felt as if, oh, here I have actual work to do and I can get the work done by setting up a system. And it helped having the free time. No, that is that is exactly the kind of work I'm talking about. The work we do, right? And then, mm -hmm. and I'm always in awe of poets because um, who was Randall Jarrell? I think said writing poetry is like standing out in the rain for years, hoping to be struck by lightning. And if you're struck <laughs> 12, 12 times, doing prose writing is more like um, trying to see clouds to make it rain. You know, you're you're mm -hmm. doing that. It was for me, you know, uh, to be Solomonic. It was I both was easier and harder. Um, harder because you were uh, divorced from the immediate, for a while anyway, from the immediate surface of New York existence, at least, this thing shut down. But the New Yorker, the magazine I've written for for 40 years now, was publishing every week the way it always had. And we were putting the magazine together in a way that I don't think our readers necessarily noted, completely at a distance, completely remotely. Mm -hmm. So we were working in, you know, meetings like this, a fact checker, an ed a copy editor, David Remnick and Alice's position and putting the magazine together. And for two years, really, none of us ever saw each other. And yet the magazine had to coalesce more or less organically around that. So that was very positive responsibility. You know, we, there was no um, uh, there was no slacking off. You know, it's a weekly magazine. And um and I, I loved having that responsibility. Kept me sane. I don't know what this would have been like had we not been in this period of time where we had Zoom to be able to at least in some form or another connect because yeah. it's, it's the only way that we could have stayed alive. I know, <laughs> I know because ours is basically a social business. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all story based. It's people telling their stories to us and coming in and getting other people's stories. And so without Zoom to be able to connect with, you know, author events and book talks and things like that, I just, I would have, it would have been, I think it would have been much worse a generation ago. Yeah. Oh, there's no question, right? I mean, even though I'm, you know, I often think that when our great, great grandchildren, I see a beautiful child there from Elizabeth Metzger's uh, a beautiful baby when that baby grows up right and has children of her own try and everything is you know virtual reality and we're all you know three to three d uh uh figures in each other's living rooms and we try to explain to someone no 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 the way we did it was we had these screens on our computers and they were broken up into these little checkerboards and that's how we got through the great pandemic of of 2020 um, they won't believe it, but it's been it's the it's been our community. It's been our uh, our village. But yeah. had, had had we lived had this occurred and we weren't already almost post television to sort of constant visuals, it would have been very different because it would have been no such thing as Zoom, mm -hmm. and and television television was never going to play that role. That that even that radio played when radio was radio was more necessary when before television. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, now, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I have we we need to wind up our hour, and I don't want to, but I must. And so I have two questions for you. And as I've said before, they're not homework. So if you don't have a steady answer or an easy answer. No harm, no foul. But I do want to know if you know of any emerging authors that we might not have heard about that you want to give a shout out to. Anybody? Just yeah, off the top I, of your head. A poet whom I met and heard read um, this summer at Breadloaf, um, her name is Rachel Mannheimer. And her first book is called Earth Room. And um, I was just blown away by the reading I've since read the book and find it I it's been a long time since I've discovered a new writer where I feel I'm really learning something new about oh poems can do this thing too so that's been exciting um I'm looking forward to what more she might have later if I, I can like to hear new people go ahead I'm sorry I, I, no, I was just going to say my you know great passion 
as for poetic reporting, if if Carl and Gail will allow me to call reporting poetic reporting in the, the great tradition of Joseph Mitchell and A.J. Liebling, my own two gods. And uh, uh, there's a, a youngish writer named David Giffels, whose book I happen to have on my desk here, called Barnstorming Ohio to Understand America. And I met him just in the before time in Akron, Ohio. And he's a wonderful poetic reporter about the life of the American Middle West, its abandoned industrial cities and its decaying farmlands and its renewals of hope and its comedy. His wonderful, unsentimental and comic eye for um, what used to be called Middle America. And um, it fills my, it, if I want to try and understand an America that's outside the, the parochial dimensions of uh, Manhattan, I have turned to him. And I urge everyone to, uh, to read his stuff, um, David Geffel's uh, Barnstorming, Ohio, which is published by Hachette. What, what is this first name again? David, David Giffels. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what are you all reading right now? What's on your nightstand? What are you reading? I'm reading three books. You know, my reading is often held hostage to my writing because the New Yorker throws six books at me and says, mulch these down into, <laughs> into uh, nutrients and grow uh, a little weed, several weeds out of it. So I'm reading three interesting books about uh, American transportation, uh, a fascinating book called Carmageddon, a kind of anti-car diatribe, and another book about parking, about the disaster of, of parking, and then uh, another book about the, uh, the, the misshapen history of public transit in, uh, in the 1940s and 1950s. So I'm hoping to mulch them down into a reflective piece about uh, how Americans get from place to place, why trains are always better in Europe, and how mm -hmm. we escape from the uh, from the empire of the car, if we want to. Wow. I'm reading, I'm beginning my first Elias Kennedy book. I, I've never read him before, and I think my brother knew that I was woefully ignorant and brought me an, an Elias Kennedy reader, which I'm loving. Sounds great. I actually don't know his work very well. I, I've been doing a deep dive into Banana Yoshimoto's fiction. Uh -huh. um, I had only read Kitchen when it first came out in the late 80s or something. Somehow on Twitter, I heard more about her. So I, I'm reading Asleep, it's called. It's three short stories. Mm -hmm. I just finished a collection of short stories called Lizard. Mm -hmm. And another one that has two novellas, um, Hard Boiled and Hard Luck. So it's just all banana, Yoshimoto, for the past few weeks. But I'm loving it. I, I was reading, I started to read Annie Ernaux. And oh, yeah. I, um, I might be through with Annie Ernaux. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, I first read Annie Ernaux in the 1990s when I was living in France and um, was very struck by her and was pleased to see that she won the Nobel but I will say this is the terrible, stupid, snobbish, and yet often true thing. I don't think she reads as well in translation as she mm. does. She's a cameo cutter, if you know what I mean. And I'm not sure that the cameos are as beautifully incised in English as mm. they, she's they really are. really about the culture. I mean, she's yeah. about French culture. Yeah. So really exactly. exactly. Folks, it's been a wonderful evening. You guys absolutely encapsulate what's perfect about Right America and getting people together to talk about their work, each other's work, where it takes you, and the serendipitous way that you all connected over a flea. It just was, <laughs> I thought that was so wonderful. Um, I am going to have to say good night. Um, I'm going to minimize each of you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. You, you Thanks, are everyone. so welcome. Maybe we can have a wealthy drive-in reunion. That would be you guys great. You're so fun. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Folks, um, I want to thank Carl, Gale, and Adam for sharing their work and their thoughts, and to everyone who tuned in tonight. And thank you to Roger Rosenblatt for creating this original and important series. 
I bid you good night until next Tuesday, January 31st, as we wind down Write America with our final episode featuring Laura Tucker and Roger Rosenblatt. Please remember to check out Bird's Book's Write America page where you can find a link to all of the episodes preserved on YouTube. Thank you again. Good night.